we're going to look at are density curves. And a density curve is just the distribution of a frequency of a continuous variable. If you look at the graphic on the right, you see a, a frequency distribution of vocabulary scores. Now technically the bars indicate that this is a discrete distribution. And I can show that with a histogram. I've superimposed a smooth curve over that, which is our density curve. And density curves are when we have continuous variables. And we're going to treat this vocabulary score as if it was continuous. Notice that this particular distribution has a couple of features to it. Uh, that the scores of many of these students taking this vocabulary test, the, uh, Indian, the uh, Iowa Test of Basic Skills, kind of pile up in the middle and trail off near the tails. This particular distribution is symmetrical. There's no big large or gaps. There's no obvious outline cases. And from other courses you've taken, or maybe uh, material from high school, you would say this looks to be approximately normally distributed. The smooth curve I've drawn over there is a pretty good description of these actual data. So a probability density curve, the way we're going to use it, is going to be a theoretical distribution. We're going to use a smooth curve to describe the proportion of observations that fall within particular ranges of values. And one thing to understand here when we talk about proportions in this context, they're equal to probabilities. So we're really talking about probabilities. If you look at the graphic at the bottom right, you'll notice three vertical lines. The vertical line in the middle represents the mean. The vertical line on the right cuts off a certain area of the distribution, and I've shaded the area in the tail gray. And then there's a line to the left, and that, shades, that cuts off an area in the lower tail of this distribution. In the gray areas of the tails, you'll see the numbers 0 0.025. That means that the shaded gray area occupies 0 0.025 of the entire distribution, or combined in both tails, there's 0.05. We know that the area under this curve is equal to 1, and therefore, between the two outer bars, the two vertical bars, lies 95% of the distribution of, of this uh, density curve. That is to say, if we had a distribution that looked something like this, and we were to pick a case at random, then there's a 0.95 probability that it would fall between those two outer bars. On the bottom scale, the x-axis, you'll notice that things are measured in SD, which stands for Standard Deviation Unit, otherwise known as Z-scores. And we're going to get to Z-scores uh, in a minute. This particular kind of distribution is a normal distribution. This is a, a kind of an interesting point. When people talk about the normal distribution, um, there really is no single normal distribution. There is a family of normal distributions, each one defined by a particular mean and a standard deviation. If you think about all the numbers in the universe, if there's an infinite number of means and an infinite number of standard deviations, then there's an infinite number of normal distributions. The one normal distribution that we're most interested in is called the Gaussian normal distribution, and that's the normal distribution that has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. If you look at the formula kind of on the middle to the left, it looks uh, kind of complicated, but when you look at it carefully, you'll notice that most of the things uh, in that formula are constants. 1 is a constant, 2 is a constant, E is a constant. In fact, the only things that really can change here are the mean and standard deviation. So there's a family of normal curves, but they do share some characteristics. For example, if you look at the vertical bars on this chart, any time you move one z-score or one standard deviation from the mean, you capture approximately 34% of that distribution. Or in other words, the probability of selecting a case at random and having it be between 0 and 1 is 0.34. Another way of thinking about this is approximately 68% of all the, of this distribution lies within one standard deviation of the mean. That is 0.341 plus 0.341, or 68% lies approximately plus or minus one standard deviation. So there's a very regular pattern to the area under this curve between any two points that are consistent with all normal distributions. And again, remember that area is equal to probability. This lets us come up with a guideline, and we'll be more specific about this a bit later, but we'll just call this the 68, 95, 99.7 guideline. 
So if we start at the mean as our center point, if we were to move one standard deviation above and one standard deviation unit below, so that area, plus or minus one standard deviation unit, covers approximately the middle 68% of the distribution. If we were to move a little further out from the mean and go two standard deviation units, we would capture approximately 95% of that frequency distribution, uh, or that, that density curve. That is, we would capture the middle 95%. And if we were to move plus or minus three standard deviations out, we'd capture nearly the whole distribution, uh, more specifically, about 99.7% of the distribution. What, we, what we're going to do, what we do with z-scores, is we are just standardizing our measurement. We're changing from one measurement to another. Say, for example, we're measuring age, uh, people's age, and we are then going to convert it to a z-score using a z-transformation. Here's the formula for the z-score. Uh, notice that uh, one of these, the one on the left is for uh, samples, the one on the right is for populations. Obviously they're identical, they do the same thing. Um, notice that there's no summation sign in here. A z-score is not a summary statistic. It's a value for every case in your data set. For example, let's say that um, we had a, an examination and the average score or mean y bar was equal to 85 and the standard deviation was equal to 5. If I told you that you were one z-score above the mean, you would know that that would be equal to 85 plus 5 or 90. These two scores, the 90 and the 1, are identical. They're just in different units. One is the raw unit, the thing that we're measuring the exam score in, the 90, and the other is in a standardized unit that will allow us to use the normal distribution, the Gaussian normal distribution, and the table in the back of the book to interpret how far out in that distribution you are, how far above average you are. Similarly, if I told you that you got a score of 80 on that examination, you would know that you were one standard deviation unit below the mean. Now you can look at the bottom and go through those proofs. They're not particularly important for this class, but they demonstrate the two key characteristics of a z-score, of a variable that's been transformed to a z-score. First of all, the mean of that new variable will be equal to 0, and the standard deviation will be equal to 1. And that's just axiomatic. axiomatic. These proofs show that anytime you take any variable and you convert it to a z-score, it will have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Some people get confused by this and believe that by transforming a variable to a z-score, they are making it normally distributed, and that's not correct. If your original distribution, say age, is skewed, then your z-score distribution of age will also be skewed. Here's what's going on. Um, there's three distributions at the top. Notice that they have three different means. One has a mean of 4, one of 12, and one of 20. When we convert all those scores, 4, 12, and 20, to z-scores, based on the respective standard deviation of each of those distributions, they all become equal to 0. Similarly, the distribution on the, at the low end with the mean of 4 has a standard deviation of 1. A value of 5 is one standard deviation unit above the mean. The middle distribution, the one with the mean of 12, has a standard deviation equal to 2. That is, if I'm at 12, and then I go to 13 and to 14, I've moved one standard deviation unit. When 14 in that distribution is converted to a z-score, it's equal to 1. The implication here is that scores of 5 in the low distribution, 14 in the middle distribution, and 21 in the distribution with the greatest mean are all in the same relative position in their distributions. They are all one standard deviation unit above the mean. Here's a table from the back of the book. This is a, not a very good z-score table, but it, it's the one we have available to us. There's three columns um, that are important. The first column is the z-score column. In there, so we're seeing on this page 0 .00, I'm sorry, 0, .00, 0, .00, 0, .01, and so forth. The column next to that is called the area from 0 to z, and the description of that, the graphical description of it, is circled up top. What that gives you is the area from that z-score, or from a value of 0, from the mean, to that particular z-score. So looking at the bottom of this, I see a z-score of 0.2. It tells me that if I go from the mean 
of 0 to 0 0.2, I cover 0 0.0793 of this particular distribution. The next column is the area measured from the z-score you've looked up to infinity, or to the tail of the distribution. So again, if I go from the mean of 0 and I go to uh, 0.2, I have moved 0 0.0793 into the distribution, which leaves 0 0.4207 in the tail, out towards infinity. One thing to note about the table in your book is it only has positive z-scores. If you have a negative z-score, that is, you'd have a value that's below average and you convert it to a z-score, it will be negative, then you have to keep track which side of the mean it's on, whether it's on the negative or positive side. You're only getting area above the mean in this particular table. Let's focus on another page of your uh, table. Um, so this is page 460 from the book. And if you look at the highlighted area at the bottom, you'll see that there's a z-score of 1. So the number next to that, 0 0.3413, tells me that the area in the density function between 0 and 1 I'm sorry, between, yeah, between 0 and 1 is 0.3413, or approximately 34%. The area beyond 1, greater than 1, is 0.1587. And here again, we can see that if we talked about what is the area between uh, the mean plus or minus 1 standard deviation, it would be 0.3413 plus 0.3413, or 0.6826. Here's a table that has a lot more detail in it. <clears throat> it's the entire Z table, but on one page. And I'm going to use this to show you, it's a little bit easier to show you with this particular Z table, um, the two ways we can use this table. Of course, one way is we might know a Z score and then look up an area. And another way is we might have an idea about what area we're interested in and look up a Z score. And it's much easier with this particular table. So here's three numbers I've highlighted, a z-score of 1, a z-score of 2, and a z-score of 3. The way you read this table is you look at the z column and get the first number and first decimal place of your z-score, and then you read across the top row to get the second decimal place. So when you see that first highlighted box where it says 1.0, it's really 1.000. .000. That is, if I go one standard deviation unit from the mean, I go 0.3413 as a proportion through that distribution. If I look at both sides of the mean, that's approximately 68% of the distribution. Moving down to the next highlighted box where it says 2.0, which is really 2.000, you see that the area there, that is from the mean of 0 to a z-score of 2, or two standard deviation units, is 0.4773. If I say what area is under this distribution plus or minus two z-scores, two standard deviation units, I would double that number and I would get approximately 95.46. The third highlighted box shows us a z-score of three and you can see if you double the number there you get 99.73. So here's what we said when we had made up our little uh, guideline. We had the 68, 95, and 99 rule. This is our 99.7 rule. This is where it comes from. Now let's look inside the table and look at some other numbers. Here I've highlighted um, three other numbers. So let's go to the z-score of 1.96. That's in the red box that's uh, highlighted with the number 4750. If I have a z-score of 1.96, the area under my normal distribution between 0 and 1.96, approximately 2, is 0 0.4750. If I want to know what area is between plus or minus 1.96, I take the 0 0.4750 and double it, and I find out it's 0.95 or 95%. Let's go to the next number in the table, 2.58. If I look up a z-score of 2.58, the area is 0.4951. Okay? If I have 0.4951, I'm capturing the middle 99% of the distribution. 
And then finally, I could capture the middle 99% of the distribution by going plus or minus 3.3 standard deviation units, 3.3 z-scores. These numbers, the 1.96, the 2.58, and the 3.3 will be used very often in our work in statistics. They'll define regions or areas of things that we think are likely to be due to chance, the, nine, the 0.95, the 0.99, the 0.999, the area in the middle, and things that we think are statistically rare or unlikely to occur by chance, and that's the area in the tails of the distribution. If you haven't had a stat st statistics class before, this might be a little confusing, but that's okay. We're going to be able to explain this to you in class, how we're going to use these three numbers to compare something we observe, some, something we actually measure and observe, to what should occur if chance is operating. And we're going to start establishing that this normal distribution is a picture of chance. This is what the world looks like if chance is operating and then we compare to chance what we actually observe. Thanks for watching the video and if you have any questions be certain to email me or give me a call.